Giant dragon was about to eat Tokyo. Fortunately, it was only a movie. Or is it? Here's the first question from Isaac. Do dragons really exist? <laughs> the short answer is... It's a mystery. But some people say yes. There was a fire-breathing dragon in the land, and it had terrible wings and scales sort of like my armor, and I defeated it with this magic sword. No villager saw it, because, because it turned invisible. <laughs> it, it, it turned invisible because it was magic. That's like my magic sword. Yes, that's what happened. Hey, who's laughing? I'm not making this up. I'll have at you with my magic sword. <laughs> hey, come back here, you coward. Let me have at you with my magic sword. <laughs> ah, dragon attack! Help! There's a dragon trying to attack me! Ah! Just a dragon kite from China. Cultures from all around the world have dragon legends. From Europe to Asia, artists and performers tell stories about dragons. Some of the dragons look like lizards, some look like snakes, and some of them with wings look like giant bats. So many dragon stories from so many different countries. Today, though, we know that dragons really don't exist, right? Huh? But I said dragons don't exist. That can't be right. My computer says that dragons really do exist. Whoa, maybe there is a reason to all these dragon legends. Well, maybe there's huge reptile monsters. Maybe your questions on reptiles will help me out. I've got to find out the truth. What's the difference between a reptile and an amphibian? Well, Livia, reptiles and amphibians are easy to mix up. They're all animals that don't have fur. But there's one big thing that makes them different. Frogs and salamanders are amphibians, which means they start life in the water as fishy-like animals. Then they grow legs and can walk on the ground and breathe air. Reptiles are born looking like little versions of the grown-ups. The babies look so cute. But then they get really big. <gasps> okay, not that big but still big enough to be scary. Marnie had a question about that. Which was the biggest reptile that ever lived? The biggest reptile that ever lived? The giant lizard that ate Tokyo, of course. Ice cream mountain? Just kidding. But you know what's amazing? Reptiles never stop growing. They grow their whole lives. Hey, come back with my house. OK, my pet gecko won't get that big. Even though reptiles keep growing, they slow down when they get old. But some can still get pretty big. Who's the biggest? The saltwater crocodile is probably the biggest reptile alive. The biggest turtle is the leatherback sea turtle. Its babies can fit in your hand but they grow to be as long as your bed. And some pythons can be almost four times as tall as I am. People used to think dinosaurs were reptiles. That would have made them the biggest reptiles ever. How is it going, big guy? Today, scientists think dinosaurs were their own group of animals. They weren't reptiles, but I wondered, could dinosaurs be those dragons that we hear stories about? Nope. 
My research says that dinosaurs were extinct way before humans existed. I guess I have to take some more questions. Here's one from Sammy. How do some reptiles crawl on walls? To find out how reptiles climb the walls, please welcome reptile expert, Pat Benatar. Hi, Harrison. Hey. Thank you for having me on your show. This is my lizard, Spike. Oh, I sure hope he doesn't climb my walls. It looks like he'd scratch them all up. Actually, this is not a wall climber. His feet are not made for climbing walls, but your gecko sure can. Oh, he sure does. Look, he's climbing, but how come your lizard can't do that? Your gecko has little hairs on the end of each of his toes that help him to stick to things with static electricity. Hairs? I don't see any hairs on his feet. Well, it's kind of like this. If I take this balloon and rub it on you, it'll stick. That's static electricity. That's what we believe happens with geckos. It's still a bit of a mystery. I wish I could use my hands and feet to walk on walls. Actually, scientists are working on something like that, but you won't find that in anybody's home anytime soon. I wonder if I could get some good ideas from... If you were going to climb a wall, how would you do it? I would put sticky stuff on my hands and feet, and then I'd be able to climb. I would fly. I would put suction cups on my hands and feet. I would call Superman and he'd lift me up onto the roof. I can cut a hole in the roof, then I can use the ladder, and I can yell the, I'm in the top in the world! <laughs> well, I would grab some trampoline, I'd start <laughs> bouncing and bouncing and bouncing until I got high enough to, like, hurt myself from the roof. Does that sound safe? No! Yeah. Well, sometimes my mom says that I make her climb the walls. <laughs> Lance had another question about how reptiles walk. How do snakes move without legs? For critters without legs, snakes really get around. The secret is scales. A snake's scales grip the ground sort of like the bottom of your sneakers. And I found out that snakes can move in four different ways by scrunching itself up, then stretching out in front, by wiggling in an S pattern, by sidewinding, which is sort of like flinging itself, or by creeping like a caterpillar. To find out more about how snakes move, it's time for... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are... Jordan. Yeah! Charles. Yeah! Tristan. Yeah! And Veronica. Yeah! So you're probably wondering why you're dressed up in these snake costumes. Yeah. 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 Well, today you're gonna pretend to be snakes and race to the finish line, and the first one to eat their gummy mice will be the winner. Good? Yeah! Okay, and Pat is here to provide some tips to get you there the fastest. Okay, what you guys gotta do is you gotta slither like snakes. Now don't forget, snakes don't have arms or legs, so you've gotta press your parts of your body onto that mat and squirm yourself forward. Move along just like a snake. You guys have a goal. You gotta get to that gummy mouse and eat it. Okay. Slither like snakes. Are you ready? Yeah! Get set and go! Oh, look at this. I think Jordan has a good technique down. Yeah, he's got it going on there. Look at that. We're getting there. Oh, Jordan's oh, already. Jordan's way ahead. <laughs> and he's getting the gummy mouse. Come on, Veronica, you can get up there. I think Jordan's got it. Jordan's got it. Gonna get there. <laughs> and then second place, we got Charles. <laughs> Uh, Veronica's stuck. Come on, Veronica. Slither like a snake. Dig in and move. You can do it. You're almost there. She's almost there. Slither, slither. <laughs> Jordan was so fast. Oh, man, she's going to get it. Get it, get it. Get, it. get the gummy mouse. There we go. Can do it. There yeah. You go. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> so it looks like Jordan's our winner. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so what was your slithery technique that you used to get to the finish line? What I did is I used my shoulders and put them really into the ground. And I didn't really like just go like this. I actually turned a lot and actually put my shoulders into the ground. So you like turned your whole body to get into yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, nice. And what about you? Um, I tried to do as big zigzags as possible to pull me from side to side to go across. Right. 
I use my feet and, uh, and pretty much every part of my body that sticks out a bit to dig into the mat and push myself forward. Well, my technique was that if I go left to right, it would work, but it didn't work as much. So you guys did great. You basically moved like snakes. So I have a little prize for every one of you. More gummy mice. Yay! <laughs> Geez, snakes are so hungry. <laughs> so obviously snakes don't really eat gummy mice. But here's another question about that. What do reptiles eat? Reptiles can eat bugs, fish, and small animals. Oh, and snakes can eat big animals like deer. Wait, what? How is it possible? A deer is this big, and a snake's mouth is only that big. How can a snake even do it? How does his mouth not rip open, or his head not explode? Uh-oh, my head's starting to overload! Ah! I think my head would explode if I tried to eat something that big. Well, actually, when snakes eat, they dislocate the back of their jaws like this so that they can swallow things larger than their heads. Whoa, so they can just unhook their jaw like that? Exactly. Wow, this gives me an idea for... Uh-oh, do try, try this, this at home. home. Want to know how big of a bite you could take if you were a snake? Open your mouth as wide as you can and measure. Now expand it by this much. If you were a snake, you could eat a whole watermelon in one bite. <laughs> Speaking of weird things about snakes, Paolo had a question. How can a snake not die if it has poison? That is weird, but I found out that it's because snake venom is different from poison. It is weird that a venomous snake doesn't die from its own venom inside of it, but I'm pretty sure that Pat knows the answer. The difference between venom and poison is that venom has to be in the bloodstream for it to work, whereas poison has to be swallowed. Venomous snakes actually inject their venom into their prey and it helps them to pre-digest their food. Oh, I saw this video where a venomous snake eats another venomous snake. Is that true? Yeah, many venomous snakes eat other venomous snakes. Once again, the venom has to be injected into the blood, so that venomous snake, if you got bitten by the other one, that could be deadly. But just by digesting it, it's not a problem at all. Well, I bet snakes don't taste good. Believe it or not, some people eat rattlesnakes. Eat rattlesnakes? I'm pretty sure there's an easier lunch to catch than that. Speaking of venomous snakes, I found videos of some of the most dangerous snakes in the world, like the puff adder and the black mamba in Africa, the tiger snake in Australia, the desert horned viper in the Middle East, the common crate, and the world's largest venomous snake, the king cobra in Asia. And in North America, the rattlesnake is one of the most poisonous snakes. You didn't bring a rattlesnake with you, did you? Fooled you. I always fall for pranks. You know who hates pranks? Snakes. Do not poke, do not provoke. Snakes who cannot take a joke. Don't give a cobra stinky gum or ring an adder's bell and run. Their bite's no fun, their bite's no fun. Don't photobomb a bite for class or stick your tongue out at an ass. You'll be sad if it gets mad Because that fright could be your last Their bite's no fun, their bite's no fun Yeah! I guess snakes can't take a joke. <laughs> oh, apparently I can't take a joke very well either. Thanks, Pat, for being on my show. My pleasure. Now here's another question from Brianna. How come reptiles have to go on rocks to stay warm? <laughs> To answer your question, I'm here with my friend, Little Ray, at his own reptile zoo. 
Hey Harrison, thanks for having me on the show. And this is the hammer, one of our green iguanas that we have at the zoo. <laughs> so reptiles like to sunbathe, why is that? Well, reptiles unlike us are ectothermic or cold-blooded. We're endothermic or warm-blooded. And what this means is that we can control our own body temperature. If we get too hot, we sweat to cool down. Too cold, we can shiver to warm up. Mm -hmm. Reptiles like the hammer can't do that. His body temperature is actually uh, controlled by the temperature of his surroundings. He's looking pretty warm right now. Should we try to cool him off? Well, he will sit under a heat lamp like this to warm himself up or under the sun. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he can get really hot. But when he gets too hot, we don't have to do anything to cool him down. He will actually physically move to a cooler area if he starts to get too hot. This rock is too hot. Ouch. This rock is too cold. This rock is just right. Ah. Oh, yeah. Ah. I saw something really weird that happens to reptiles when they get too cold. Does this really happen? Well, it actually, it does. If reptiles do get too cold, especially if they're living in a place where they're not supposed to be, or there's a cold snap, uh, when they get really cold, their bodies will just start to shut down, and they just can't move very well. So if they're up in a tree, if it's windy, if all of a sudden a branch moves, if they try to walk, if they lose their grip, they just can't kind of re-grab on. And iguanas and other reptiles can fall out of trees. So do you get them air conditioners in the summer and heaters in the winter? Well, we, we do have to control their uh, the heat in their habitat, but what we do is we keep the zoo at a comfortable temperature for people, and then we use heat lamps and heat pads, and the reptiles are able to kind of manage their own body temperature on their own. We give them the choice and they go where they like. Cool. Next question. It's from Jesse. Why is a crocodile's back so hard? Oh, I know the answer. That's easy. So an action hero can cross a river on a crocodile's back. Ow. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> I'm sure there's more to it than that. Let's just ask the crocodile. The I don't know. Or maybe Little Ray instead. So, why do crocodiles have hard backs? Well, Harrison, crocodiles have osteoderms in their skin. And right. osteoderms are bony plates that are actually inside their skin. You can actually touch them if you want. Not gonna bite? Nope, you're gonna be fine. Okay. And when you're touching them, you're actually touching skin. These little bumps that you see are yeah. bones that are inside their skin, not under their skin, not on top of their skin, but she's covered in skin just like we have, and these are bone plates that they have for armor. Actually, if you wanna hold them, just put your really? hand underneath like that and grab them at the base of his tail, just like that. So what's the advantage of having the bones inside of the skin like that? Well, crocodilians are highly social animals. Uh, they do live in groups and they're super powerful and they will fight. And if you look, base of the skull, their yeah. neck, the core parts of their body, the base of their tail, that's where these really heavy armored plates are. If they do get in a fight, all the armor is in the core parts of their body. Right, well, you should probably take them back before I get bit. I got them for you, buddy. <laughs> cool, well, Yasmina had another question about reptiles. Are most reptiles dangerous? So, are most reptiles dangerous? Like, what about this guy? He doesn't look very dangerous to me. Well, most reptiles are not dangerous, but some of them, when they are dangerous, some can be very dangerous. Venomous snakes, big crocodiles, things like that. This guy, on the other hand, certainly doesn't look like he's overly dangerous, doesn't look too big. However, he has razor sharp teeth. Uh, and a bite from this one, Harrison, you would probably be getting a few dozen stitches if it's a simple bite from him. So as much as he doesn't look too bad, you do have to respect that different animals certainly can be very dangerous. So what does he eat? Invertebrates, giant walking sticks, and things. He eats uh, small birds, lizards, sometimes small mammals that live high in the canopy of the rainforest in New Guinea, where he comes from, lives high up in the trees. So he doesn't eat people, does he? No, he doesn't eat people, but he is a cousin of the Komodo dragon, one of the most infamous lizards in the world, and they have been documented actually attacking and killing people. Yikes, uh, well, this guy's starting to make me nervous now. What if he gets out? Well, he won't get out, Harrison, but for the kids out there, if you're ever exploring and you see an animal in the wild, you should just not approach them, leave them alone. Most reptiles are harmless. However, there are some dangerous animals out there that you might not think are. Right, well, thanks for being on my show. Harrison, thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> see you later. See you later, alligator. You'd never hurt me, would you? You're not like a Komodo dragon. Hey! Komodo dragon! That might be the answer to the mystery that started us off. Do dragons really exist? 
The big answer is... Sort of. The dragon monsters we hear about in stories aren't real, but some dragon myths probably come from exaggerations of real reptiles. Snakes that open their jaws to eat something bigger than they are. Giant lizards that bite. Lizards whose tongues look like flames. See, I wasn't making it up. Okay, maybe the fire breathing part. And the magic part. And the invisible part. I guess if you've never seen a snake or a lizard before and someone started telling you about them and they were exaggerating about them, then maybe you'd start to believe that they were actually really giant dragons that existed. Fortunately, there are no dragons in my attic. <laughs> Did I fool you? Well, Reptiles aren't scary, fire-breathing monsters at all. Ah! I thought you were a nice reptile. Ah! See you next time for more finding stuff out. Ah! <laughs> Welcome to finding stuff out. It's a little crazy in here today. I started a pet sitting service to answer all of your questions about pets. And apparently, sitting doesn't happen during pet sitting. Some of the animals stayed up all night. The dog wants to go out, the cat is hiding, the snake wanted to eat the guinea pig. I can't remember if these food pellets belong to the hamster or the turtle. Plus, someone just called to see if they could bring over a lemur. I don't even know what a lemur is! Ah! You're gonna make my head explode! Taking care of pets is a lot harder than I thought. I hope your questions about pets will help me figure out what to do. Here's a question from Brianna. Why don't people have wild animals as their pets? The short answer is... Because some regular pets are wild enough, and some other animals would rather make you their snack than be your pet. Unpetable pets, the worst pets you can get. Sharks that have sharp, snappy jaws, a tiger with long, scratchy claws, a bear who thinks you look delish, a creepy monster looking fish. Unpetable pets, the kind you shouldn't get. A lion king who thinks you're lunch, a warthog with mean pointy tusks, a vulture who would eat you up. Unpetable pets, they're not for us. It would be cool to ride a pet zebra or have seals swimming in a pool, but why can't we? I promise to find the answers by the end of the show. Now here's a question from Sarah. Why are black cats bad luck? The flat earth corner! Black cats aren't really black cats. They're witches who turn themselves into cats. That's right, witch. I know you're in there. In medieval Europe, people believed in witchcraft. When they started getting sick from a disease called the Black Plague, they thought that cat witches were responsible for their bad luck. And we all know that black cats cause it, so we need to get rid of them. Meow. <laughs> Nice kitty. Today, we know that black cats aren't witches, but some people are still scared of them, which is why you see a lot of them at Halloween. But guess what? It turns out that the Black Plague was a disease carried by rats. And you know who eats rats? Cats. So getting rid of black cats made the problem even worse. Ugh, I guess that is a drawback. Here's a question from Jessica. Can my cat Fluffy live outside and never come back into my house? I hope so, Jessica, because the cat I'm pet sitting may have escaped. You don't see him anywhere, do you? He's really big, but he still manages to hide somehow. Anyway, so the answer to your question is yes. Your cat could live outside, but it's probably not a good idea. 
I found out that when cats play, they're practicing their hunting skills, just like these cubs. So, Fluffy has the instincts to survive outside. But some pet owners have their cat's claws removed, which means the cat would have a hard time hunting or surviving. And most cats like being taken care of. Except for that one. This is a bit much. I need the help of an expert. He's an expert on animals, even as his own zoo. Please welcome Seth Falk. Hi, Harrison. Someone dropped off a macaw here for you to pet sit. Oh, cool. Can I wear it on my shoulder like a pirate? Absolutely. Her name is Sapphire, and she's a green ring macaw. Awesome. So, does it need a cage, or can it just fly around freely? She sleeps in a cage at night, but she needs eight hours a day of interaction and playtime and lots of special foods. Right. Oh, I think there's another guest here with a pet. Can oh, you take care of it while no I problem. answer another question? Here's a question from Rebecca. Why do cats stay up at night but sleep in the day? Tell me about it. Pets don't live on our schedule. You can't just give them a bedtime. I'm not sleepy. I want another bedtime story. <sighs> cats aren't the only ones that stay up all night. Guess who was spinning on his wheel at 3 a.m.? Oh, sure. Now you're sleepy, Mr. Hamster. He partied all night. <laughs> I got a plan. I'm gonna separate the pets into two groups. Day sleepers and night sleepers. Isn't that smart? Hey Harrison, someone dropped off another pet for you to look after. Oh, nice. This is Mochi, she's a chinchilla. So, is it a day sleeper or a night sleeper? She's in between, she's up at dusk and dawn. In between day and night? That means I have an animal up all the time that's always needing my attention. Yep. <sighs> I have a question about that. It's from Daphne. Why do pets need so much care? Yeah, that's what I would like to know. Let's hear what you have to say. Let's get some. I'm pet sitting a lot of pets this week, so I need these kids' help. What's the hardest part about taking care of your pet? My cat, um, whenever it goes outside, I always have to chase it back inside. When my two cats, Boot and Zazu, fight all night and I have to break them apart, one has to go inside and one has to stay outside. It's kind of hard to get my bird back in my cage because I have to always chase him around. And I, sometimes I have to pick him up and he bites my fingers really hard. My chickens uh, poo everywhere and I have to clean up the poo with a hose. And then in their cage, I have to take it out with a bag. Well, my dad normally locks tubs in the bathroom. He normally does his business on the floor. Like, there's poo and pee everywhere. I can't even step anywhere. So I accidentally kind of step in it. And then uh, it's a lot of work. And I have to clean my feet afterwards. <laughs> Yuck. That's awful. Pets take a lot of work. I better get back to taking care of mine. There sure is a lot to do. Just making sure each pet gets the right food at the right time is really tough. Here's another one. This is Periwinkle, and he's a tortoise. Another pet? This is starting to get overwhelming. Daphne had a question about why animals need so much care. Well, each type of animal has very specialized requirements. So it's about us adjusting to the lifestyle, not them adjusting to ours. Right, well, it's really hard to know when what pet needs what and when. Well, at the zoo, I use a chart. It tells me what time and which animal needs to be fed. A chart? That gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today's challengers are Casey. Yeah! Luca. Yeah! Brianna. Hi. And Sabrina. Hello. Okay, so today your challenge is to figure out what these pets want. Are you up for it? Yeah! Okay, so the four pets we have are a parrot, a cat, a hamster, and a dog. But the cat is obviously fake because my cat that I was supposed to be pet sitting went missing. Okay, so I have to make a chart to figure out what these pets' favorite toy is and their favorite food, as well as where they do their business. So maybe you guys can help me out. Okay. Cool? Okay. Yeah, All right, cool. team one is Casey and Luca. 
You'll be up first, and team two is Brianna and Sabrina. You guys will have to go downstairs first, though, so you can't see their answers. Got it. Oh, good. I see they found the cat. The two teams have to match the animal to the food it eats, the toys it likes to play with, and the item it goes to the bathroom on. There are 12 possible matches for a maximum of 12 points. Okay, remember, you only have a minute. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Get set, go! Um, um, yeah, this, no, it goes, okay. It goes through the dock. Here, go. They're bringing the ball to the hamster. Here. And the mouse to the cat. Luca can't decide who the paper towel belongs to. Hey, Luca, that's food you're holding. Casey thinks that this toy is for Coco the dog. 20 seconds left. Um, um, I think this is for Bird. Luca's finally making up his mind. And here are some plastic bags for Coco. 10 seconds. The wood shavings are for the hamster and the paper towel for the bird. Five. Four, three, two, one. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Team one ran out of time before they could place the cat litter or the bird food. And they also gave the bird the cat food. Ready? Yep. Set, go. This is the hamster. Okay, okay. The hamster oh. likes to run around in that ball all night long. This, this is the dog for sure. Dog treats, those are the easiest. And a mouse for the cat. Okay. What would this be for? Okay guys, you have 40 sec 20 seconds left. You're already at 40. Okay. Hurry, hurry. This is for the parrot, that's for sure. The paper towels are a toughie. They think the wood shavings are for the hamster and the paper towel for the bird. Hurry, you only have seven seconds. Okay, wait, this is for the cat. Four, this three, cat. two, one. <laughs> okay, time's up. Well, that was a close one. Team two ran out of time before they could place the poop bag for the dog. Food for the hamster and bird, and litter for the cat. And they gave the bird two bathroom items. Unless they think the bird eats hamster litter. Hamster litter? That's yucky. So, Luca and Casey, team one, you guys had nine points. And then, team two, that's Sabrina and Brianna, you guys had seven points, so team one's the winner! Yeah! As your prize, you guys get to help me clean up all the cages. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah. Let's do this. Just kidding, you don't have to help, but thanks for playing. Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Next question. It's from Farah. Is there a difference between my pet rat and a rat on the street? I checked, and the answer is yes and no. They're both still rats, but they're different. Rats in the street can be mean. They probably have to be to survive. But when people wanted rats for pets, they chose the gentlest, friendliest ones. And when those rats had babies, the babies got even gentler. Harrison, these rats through pet sitting make the best pets in my opinion. Rats are the best pets? Absolutely, rats are social animals. That means they have, to have lots of friends. See, Splinter here will make friends with you really quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at him scurry. <gasps> oh, do you have a dog? Oh yeah. Uh, that's my neighbor's dog, Jackson. Yeah, um, my mom says he's not allowed in the house, but I'm supposed to be pet-sitting him. Uh, do you mind washing the place while I go help that dog? It needs some special help. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Here's a question from Jacqueline. I wonder if my dog, Gypsy, could understand me when I talk to him. Can dogs understand us when we talk? To find out, I'm here with my friend, dog trainer, Jean Lazard. Hello, Harrison. Thank you for having me on your show. I hear you need help. Yeah, well, this is Jackson. I'm pet-sitting him, and uh, 
He won't calm down. Maybe you can help. Yes, I'm sure I can help. I don't know what to say to get him to calm down. OK, because he's barking at the fence, huh? Yeah, so like, do dogs speak a different language or something? Or do they not understand us or what? Because I've tried to calm him down before. <laughs> well, yes, they can uh, understand lots of words and gestures and signs. You just have to teach him. OK, well, let's So let's try. teach Jackson not to bark. So <laughs> you call him to you, have him sit. Jackson, sit. Does he do it? No? OK, well, I'll use magic. Look what I got. Sit. Oh, this works well. You want to so, try? Does the treat just like help him motivate him to say? It, it will change his emotion. So what should I say? Well, if he's barking at the fence, let's say, you can call him to you, Jackson. Ask him to sit. He will do it and treat him, reinforce him. That was a treat that you gave him? Absolutely. Okay. And I'm going to wait till he's silent and I'm going to reinforce the silence. Right, so when he's silent, that's when you give him the treat. Yeah, exactly. So you'll have him do whatever you want with this. Really? You can teach him when you bark at the fence, come to me, sit, and so sit, give him a treat. And then sit. Ask him to sit. Sit. Yes, give, give him, him a, treat. a treat. Great. So while he's eating, he's not barking. Yeah. Huh? And if you do this every time, he'll bark less and less and listen to you more and more. So not only did I learn to get Jackson to stop barking, I did it by teaching him a word. Sit. I guess they can understand what you say if you teach them what it means. Yeah. yeah, congratulations. Thanks for helping me with Jackson, but Sarah has another question about dogs. Let's look at that. Why does my dog Rocco wax his tail when somebody comes over? Yeah, why do dogs wag their tails? Well, let me show you my dog. Billy, Billy. They wag their tail to communicate. Right, so dogs wag their tails because they're happy. Well, not only because they're happy, they could wag their tail because they're anxious, because they're mad. It depends. OK, so I can pet a happy dog like Billy, right? No, no, no. But I thought you said. Yeah, you have to ask first. Right. Because you never know. The dog could be dangerous. So can I pet Billy? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks for helping me find stuff out. Welcome. Billy. <laughs> hey, Seth, is everything OK with the pets? Seth? Huh. I guess he stepped out for a second. Well, I'll just take another question. It's from Noah. My grandma has a pet monkey, and I want to know why it is so wild around other people. Your grandma has a wild monkey? Faster, Mr. Bananas. I'll be late for bingo. I hope your grandma doesn't bring her pet monkey here. I've already got my hands pretty full. Whoa. Hi, Harrison. Someone dropped off another animal. It's a monkey. This is actually a lemur. So it's related to a monkey, but a bit different. And his name is Julian. He's a ringtail lemur. <laughs> so I think the owner made a mistake, because this animal is definitely wild. It doesn't make a good pet. These guys like to finger paint with their poop all over the house. Ew. So I guess having a lemur as a pet wouldn't be a very good idea. <laughs> definitely not. They belong at the zoo or definitely in the wild. <laughs> Do you want me to take this one back to my zoo and look after it there? Yeah, that'd probably be a really great idea. <laughs> hey, when the owner gets back, I'll talk to them about what might make a more appropriate pet yeah. than a lemur. It's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's already getting a little stinky in here. But before you go, Noah had a question. Why are monkeys so wild? Do you know? Well, monkeys are wild animals. They belong in the jungle, where there's things for them to do all day, like searching for food and running away from predators. In a house, it's really boring. Right. So it makes them go crazy. So, Noah, your grandma should probably get a tame pet. Probably something like a cat. <laughs> well, not that cat. Anyway, thanks for being on my show. My pleasure, Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the answer to Brianna's question now. Why don't people have wild animals as their pets? The big answer is... Some animals just can't live with us. If we try to make them adapt, they could get crazy and sad, or they could even get sick and die. And I also know another reason why we don't have wild pets. Oh, hey, Harrison, I'm a little busy right now. My friend Little Ray owns a zoo, like Sleth. Can you believe I know two people who own zoos? Hey, Little Ray, Sarah asked why we couldn't have wild animals as pets. Well, Stuart here, my American alligator, actually used to be somebody's pet. 
uh, and he was a baby alligator that got too big. Its owner must have been some evil villain who wanted to guard his lair. Who was he? Uh, as a matter of fact, he was a teenager. Yikes, did Stuart eat him? No, Stuart started like one of our little alligators. Aw, look at the little guy. A year and a half later, he just got too big for the teenager and was given to us at the zoo. Does it happen often that people have to get rid of wild pets? Uh, it happens a fair bit, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of facilities like this, and many animals like Stuart end up being released on the side of the road, in parks, and even in ecosystems where they're not supposed to be. What happens to them? Sadly, a lot of them end up passing away and not surviving, but in, in some cases, they actually end up in ecosystems where they don't belong and they do survive and they start to breed. Uh, either case is, is terrible for the ecosystem and for the animals that are there. Aren't you scared he might eat you? Well, I'm very respectful of Stuart. Stuart and I have been working together since he was very, very small, and you know, I don't take any chances with him, uh, and he is very social, so he tolerates me, and I love him. Thanks for your help, Little Ray. Hey, thanks, Harrison. Have a great day. Goodbye, Stuart. Please don't eat Little Ray. <laughs> Woo. That sure was a wild day. And I sure hope I answered all of your questions about pets. It says there's a baby wildcat loose in my neighborhood. It looks just like... Uh-oh. Maybe the kitty I was pet-sitting wasn't a kitty at all. Seth, could you come back and help me with something? See you next time for more finding stuff out, I hope. Here, kitty kitty. Nice kitty. Oh, here, kitty. Please don't hurt me. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where I search for your answers, no matter how shocking they are. And you might be wondering why I'm walking on this red carpet. Well, it's not like I was nominated for an award or anything, but if you wanted to nominate me, that would be totally awesome. <laughs> Actually, the reason I'm walking around on this carpet is because I'm trying to answer a question about a mysterious form of energy. So if my calculations are correct and I've shuffled just enough, Ouch! <laughs> that was more than I expected. Must have been the shoes. Anyway, let's start off with a question. <clears throat> Sorry, I forgot to turn the monitor on. That's better. It's from Lucia. Why does my hair stick to my chair? The short answer is, it's caused by a powerful force of nature. And today, I'll find out what that powerful force is and how to use it to make the kids of today superheroes. So now I have to find out why your hair sticks to your chair. It's probably something sticky. I guess the mysterious force isn't peanut butter. This calls for an investigation and another question. This one's from Steven. Would you need electricity if cavemen didn't then they survive? Here's an animated clip I made that should shed some light on your question. True, cavemen didn't have electricity, but they did have another form of energy, fire, which back then wasn't easy to make. <sighs> they could use it to cook, and dry their clothes. Or even as a light to read by. And for millions of years, fire served as a cheap substitute for family entertainment. Oh no, Krog's favorite show, preempted by Weather Network. Staying warm, cooking food, and entertaining ourselves are just some of the things that we use electricity for. Now here's a question. Why do so many things run on electricity? From the world of physics, please welcome my special guest, Mark Nantel! Hi. Hi. Oh. The mysterious force. 
So why do so many things run on electricity? Well, I mean, for very different reasons. In the case of light, it's just cleaner, and it's, it's more efficient, mm -hmm. and it's safer. Uh, in the case of a drill, a hand drill, you can put it in a battery and go anywhere you want. In the case of the watch, well, you know, you don't want to have to wind your watch all the time, and no, sometimes you forget. It's a pain. It's a pain. Well, the electric one works pretty much all the time for a long time. So that's why a lot of things work on electricity, essentially. And you know, Harrison, this makes light, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it makes a lot of light, and it's great, but it's not very efficient. Yeah. Now, this little guy is very efficient. Oh. It doesn't take hardly any electricity to light up. Cool. Let me find a battery. Uh, don't worry about it. I have everything we need in this lemon. Ah. Yeah, I'll show you. We'll make a battery with lemon. Okay. The lemon juice can be what's called an electrolyte. An electrolyte is something that is used in batteries to carry electricity from one side of the battery to the other side of the battery. So, you take a lemon, you make a little slit in it. On, in the slit, you put a penny, and then you put a nail on the other side. Well, what you have here is essentially a little mini battery. Now, if you want to be clever, you make several of these guys, and then you can connect them in a row. Mm. So, yeah, you take one side to the penny, the other side of the alligator clip goes to the nail. Okay. And you continue like that for a while, and the more lemons you put, yeah. the more power you get. So let's try to make it like this with a four lemon battery. Let's see if it works. It works! Ta-da! So now there's a better saying. When life hands you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make a battery. Now here's a question from Joshua. How do we make electricity? How do we make electricity? Well, Joshua, I think we already answered your question. There's a huge pile of lemons somewhere, the size of a mountain, along with some pennies and nails, right? Well, not exactly. There are other ways to make electricity. Um, typically, you send something through a, a propeller of some kind. Mm -hmm. As it goes through, it gives electricity, and the electricity, in this case, can power yeah. The little light bulb, right? It could be wind. Sometimes you can put water and have it go down through a bunch of turbines. This is a fancy word for propellers. Okay. And then the, the propellers are connected to a generator and at the end comes out electricity. Sometimes when you don't have water and you don't have wind, you may want to generate your own by boiling water and making steam, like steam? really high pressure. Yep. And then you pass that through your propeller. And though, so how do you make the steam? You can use nuclear power, or you can decide to burn fossil fuels like mm -hmm. coal or petroleum or natural gas. But uh, another way you can do power that doesn't involve steam or nuclear power or anything are some maybe more uh, sustainable ways, using what the Earth already gives you. Something like geothermal. So the Earth is hotter inside the Earth. Yeah. So if you dig a hole in the Earth, it's hotter than at the top. So you can actually get some of the heat that's there in order to help you generate electricity but also you can use the tides. So if you go at high tides, you make sure there's water somewhere, and when tide becomes lower, all the water comes back down to go to the sea, and that's when you make it go through propellers again and turbines. So no matter how you make the turbine turn, it generates electricity. And the other way you could do it is using solar panels. So mm -hmm. the sun is always there, it's shining on the earth anyway, it's wasting a lot of energy. Let's imagine this is the sun, right? Okay. All right, well, it's, yeah, just imagine. And we light this up, Watch it. Yay! There's your car. So we generated electricity that powered the little car just from the solar panel that's on its back. No turbine needed. So until we're using things that don't create pollution, how do we cut down on it? You could use less electricity. That's the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have lights on in the house that you don't need to have on, turn it off. You could still leave the TV on if you're watching this show, though. Yeah. Now here's a question from Kirsten. How does electricity travel through wires? Imagine that a wire is this tube. Just like those marbles yeah. slide from one end of the tube to the other, when you turn a switch, all of a sudden, the electricity goes to where it's needed. If you turn off the switch, it stops. Turn on the switch, it goes. So what are the marbles supposed to be? Well, they're kind of an analogy to uh, electrons. Okay. Electrons are little bits, the smallest bits of electricity you can find. Cool, that was very illuminating. Thanks for being on my show, Mark. No problem, my pleasure. Speaking of moving electricity down a wire, it's time for... My Great Challenge! So Shishana and Olivia take your positions and get ready to compete. Woo! 
In real life, we have to move electricity long distances from where we make it to where we use it. So today, my great challenge is about moving electricity from one place to another. So you have to get the power from the batteries all the way up to the caveman who's holding the light bulbs, and the first one of you to get it all the way up to the caveman will be the winner. And here's the tricky part. You have to use these wires and other stuff. But none of it is long enough to run from our batteries to our caveman's light. So you have to figure out what you can connect to the wires to carry current all the way between these street lights and our cavemen. Here's a hint. Some of our materials are called conductors, meaning that electrons can flow through them. Others are called insulators, meaning that electrons can't flow through them. When I touch these wires together, a buzzer will go off and that's your signal to start. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a worm on this one. Olivia starts with the toy worm. It's made out of rubber, so the light won't go on. Rubber does not conduct electricity. It's an insulator. Shoshana tries out the steel wool. Will it work? Yes, I got one. Yes! Metal is a great conductor of electricity. Electrons easily move through it. And now Olivia is doing the same. Shoshana is trying out the light stick. Uh-oh. It may let up inside, but the outside is plastic. Another insulator. Olivia doesn't seem to be using anything plastic anymore. That metal wire works. Oh. Stay. Yep, that knitting needle is also metal. Ugh. Shoshana's catching up. They're tied now. They are both down to their last light, and Olivia is putting the pedal to the metal with aluminum foil. Oh, the caveman's torch is lit up. We have a winner. Olivia, congratulations. Congratulations. So what would you do if there was no electricity? Well, I would probably scream and run and cry. I will use like a lemon and dime and penny to light the little light. I'd play the drums. Yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> I just practiced my dancing. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't really care if there's electricity or not. I would just use a candle and just live my life. I do like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Edison did learn on how to do it, or I just use my dog to tug me to school on my scooter. <laughs> I'll scream and die. <laughs> no electricity? My show wouldn't exist. <laughs> You guys wouldn't be able to see me. <laughs> How come electric eels don't electrocute themselves? Yeah, that's weird. How come electric eels don't electrocute themselves? Now that is mysterious. I've never thought of that before. An animal that makes electricity shocks other things but doesn't shock itself with electricity that it makes inside of its own body? That's shocking! You're going to make my head explode! To find out more about electric eels, Wah! I met up with Nicole Can at the aquarium. An eel? That's not creepy enough. It has to be an electric eel. So, how do these things work anyway? Do you have to plug them in? No, not at all. These electric eels can be found in the muddy waters of South America, and they generate electricity to stun their prey and to scare their predators, the things that want to eat them. Okay, let me get out of here. <laughs> Ugh, why would you want to eat an electric eel anyway? And how do they make electricity? Well, on the back of their tail here, they actually have very specialized cells called electrocytes. And when they all fire at once, that's what creates the electric charge. Okay, so to answer Jamie's question, how come they don't electrocute themselves? The truth is, Nobody knows. There's a couple of theories out there. Some people think that maybe they're immune to electricity, or maybe they just have all of their vital organs insulated from that charge. Are they the only animals that make electricity? No, don't tell me sharks make electricity too. They're already dangerous enough with their teeth. Okay, well they don't actually make electricity, but they can detect it. They have special cells underneath their snouts, and all those cells do is they detect bioelectricity. So that's the electricity that any living thing makes, whether it's a fish or a person. Wait, did you just say a person? Yep. Dun dun dun! No, my head really is going to explode. 
If my head's going to explode, maybe I should go see Dr. Joe Macker. He's a neuroscientist. This is just one of Dr. Macker's friends. So I heard that sharks can detect electrical activity in humans, and I was wondering if it's really true that we can make electricity inside of our own bodies. Yes, that's absolutely true. And in fact, our brains can use as much electricity as a 60-watt light bulb. In fact, I can even show you that electrical activity in action in your brain right now. This is Harrison, our brain, and he's ready to be measured up. Hi. So Chantal's measuring your head and marking the spots where uh, the wires that we're going to attach to your head are going to go. They need to be on exactly the right spots above the right part of your brain. People always want to pick my brain, but this is ridiculous. Um, are these going to suck my brain out? No, but they will let us see the electrical activity of your brain. OK. My mom always thinks I'm wired. Now I'm actually wired. <laughs> that doesn't hurt, does it, Harrison? No, it's just really cold, though. Oh, it helps you keep a cool head. <laughs> this is what a bowl of spaghetti must feel like. OK. Great, so now Chantal is going to start the electroencephalogram, or EEG. So I'm ready. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes now. The first test is to check out what happens if I keep my eyes closed, and then open them. For the uh, next part, I'm going to place this light, which will flash at you, and you'll need to close your eyes for this. Okay, we're done. That was really weird. It was like the lights, and I like kind of wanted to open my eyes while they were like going, but I knew I wasn't supposed to, so I didn't. And it was just really weird. <laughs> it's time to see if I'm really full of energy. Yes! Check out my brain waves. That's electricity. So here, this is when you had your eyes closed and everything is nice and calm, and if yeah. I just move forward a little bit. Wow. Yep, right there where the yellow uh, yeah. blob is, that's when you open your eyes and suddenly uh, there's a lot more going on. Yeah, I really lit up. <laughs> you certainly did. Okay, and here we're showing you the results of the flashing light that you had. Each of these pink spikes represents the flashing light coming on and off. And as you can see, as soon as we start flashing that light at you, the activity in your brain changes completely. Yeah, it was really big and wavy there, and then as soon as the light came on, it was really small. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's true, my brain does generate electricity, but what do you use this for? Uh, well, we can use this to uh, help people with epilepsy. In epilepsy, certain parts of the brain are firing when they shouldn't be, and so we can see that with this machine, and now we can even implant a device called a pacemaker mm -hmm. into their brain, which regulates the activity so it's back to the way it should be firing. Wow, so electricity can actually correct people's problems. When you know what you're doing with it, yes. Well then, maybe you can answer this question from one of our viewers. Um, why don't grown-ups um, let kids um, touch electricity? That's a very good question. Um, in part, it's because the amount of electricity flowing within our brains is thousands of times less than what's in the wall. And also, when it's flowing from one part of our body to another, that's safe. It's dangerous when electricity comes out from outside our body and goes through us. Yeah, that's an electric shock. Exactly. So remember, kids, don't play around with electricity that comes out of wall sockets, or you'll get socked with shocks. In the 16th century, we've made huge medical advances. That's why we know that if you're suffering from certain ailments, like gout, there's a simple cure. Just stick your feet in a tub of electric eels. Whoa! What a wonderful treatment! The electric shocks hurt so much, I can't even think about my gout! A few hundred years ago, doctors used to think if you suffered from headaches or an illness called gout, like Henry VIII, King of England, that you could be cured by sticking your foot into a tub of electric eels. Nowadays, we know that electric eels can't cure anything, except maybe boredom. I guess that's why Dr. Macker didn't have any in his lab. But speaking of Dr. Macker in his lab, it's time for... <laughs> Uh -oh. Do 
try this at home. So, as I found out from Dr. Macker, your heartbeat and many other things inside of your body have electrical impulses. So to feel how that happens, place your fingers on your wrist like so. Can you feel that pulse? That's your heart pumping blood all around your body, which is controlled by tiny electrical signals. And more signals to help you keep your balance, all because of electrical impulses. You've got electricity flowing through your whole body from cell to cell at awesome speed. You've got electricity when you're looking with your eyes, when you're smelling with your nose, when you're figuring some math, when you're wiggling your toes, when you're doing funky moves, or when you start to sneeze. You've got electricity. Yeah, you've got electricity flowing through your whole body from cell to cell at awesome speed. You've got electricity. What's late night? What an electrifying question. I checked, and it's a lot like rubbing a balloon against the wall, except with way more electricity. During a storm, water droplets and clouds rub together, causing friction. This friction causes electrons, which have a negative charge, to build up inside the clouds. The Earth is positively charged. In this case, opposites attract. Eventually, the attraction is too strong, and zap! There's your lightning. It's what's called static electricity. It's exactly what happens when I rub my feet on a carpet. The friction causes the negatively charged electrons to build up in my body. The electrons have nowhere to go until I put my finger close to the positively charged chair. Then BAM! I get a shock, which is like a mini bolt of lightning. Which leads me back to the original question from Lasaya. Why does my hair stick to my chair? The big answer, Lasaya, is... The electrons! It's like a tiny version of lightning. When your hair rubs against your chair, it's picking up electrons from it. It's the same when I'm rubbing this balloon against my sweater. This creates negative and positive charges to build up. And that force causes my balloon to stick to my sweater. Cool, my own electric eel balloon animal. I think he likes me. Let's get this party started. How about some pointy teeth? Well, I guess that's goodbye to Mr. Eel. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. See you next time. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> Let the force be with you.